Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Michael Spath, and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana Voice for Peace, Justice, Human Rights, and Intercultural Encounter. This is the third of our series, Voices of Justice, Human Rights, and Moral uh, Renewal. We're delighted to speak with Dr. Mustafa Barghouti, founder of the Palestinian Medical Relief Society, Secretary General of the Palestinian National Initiative, political party, and a member of the uh, Palestinian Legislative Council. So Dr. Barghouti, uh, welcome. Thank you so much. It's good to be with you and to see all and to have contact with all these friends. Thank you so much. Good, good. Um, let's just jump right on into it, Mustafa. Uh, we're thinking so much these days. Uh, it's the 72nd anniversary of the Nakba, just a couple of weeks ago. The 20th anniversary of the, the Day of Resistance and Liberation of South Lebanon. It's the second anniversary of Gaza's Great March of Return. And with that, on June 1st, coming up, honoring Razan Anadjer and all the Palestinian healthcare heroes. As a physician and as a political leader, say a word about just the confluence of these days for you and in your work and what they mean for the Palestinian people. Well, thank you. What comes to mind is really two, two major ideas and they're connected in a way. The first idea is that uh, we, the Palestinians, who have uh, been uh, suffering from so many, uh, so many oppressions and so many attacks and so on, uh, and we had a very long history of uh, of struggle against all this injustice. I think we've developed a certain amount of resilience. Uh, and a certain amount of steadfastness during all these turmoils, uh, that uh, this has helped us really in encountering the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I don't think I would be exaggerating if I say today that if you look at world statistics, although we are under military occupation and although 77 percent of the cases we had so far came through contact with the israeli side uh, through workers we probably have the best outcome so far in the whole world if you look at the at the number of deaths if you look at the number of people sick and uh, that is happening although we are very much discriminated against uh, if you look at the amount of, uh, for instance, ventilators or respirators in Israel, it's about 4,000 pieces. And in uh, Palestinian territories in West Bank, it's only 267, in Gaza only 87. If you look at the number of tests we managed to have or perform, it's much, much less than what Israelis have. Yet, we're doing better. And uh, I think the quick reaction that we had and the very strong uh, work of civil society, which I am proud to be part of, has helped us adopt the only strategy that could succeed in our case, which is prevention. So it's a very good idea of, uh, of, of how strong uh, we've been through this COVID-19 pandemic and how we managed, regardless of discrimination, to to stand up to it. But the second thought we, I have, uh, is very, which is very important, is that while we do remember the 72nd anniversary of the Nakba, we're just about to get another Nakba, another catastrophe, uh, which is planned both by uh, Israeli extreme government, by Netanyahu, who is the ultimate uh, ultra-nationalist and, uh, and, and extremist, uh, jointly with your administration, with Trump's administration. I mean, both of them are participating now in trying to enforce what they call the deal of the century, which is nothing but a, an, a plan to annex 62% uh, of the West Bank and to prevent the possibility of a Palestinian independent state 
It's a plan to consolidate a system of apartheid and racial discrimination that is much worse than what prevailed in South Africa at one point of time. So the challenge in front of us is tremendous. And uh, we have to find and uh, identify the proper strategies to stand up to this uh, new attack and to stand up to a campaign uh, of uh, annexation that is going to hurt not only the future of Palestinians, but for Israelis for decades to come. Because if they succeed in this process of annexation, that means we're going to enter a new stage of very long struggle against apartheid. It will be bad for all of us and for the whole region and for the world. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, when he was in Israel, suggested that uh, uh, Israel had both a right and an obligation uh, to annex uh, the occupied territories. Say a word about uh, um, um, the, the appropriate and most effective response that might resist the occupation, both from uh, I internally, you know, Palestinian indigenous resistance, as well as what we in the international community can do. I think the only three things that can, defer, uh, can deter Netanyahu from conducting this plan, and uh, they have to be a combination of these three factors. The first one is uh, wide popular Palestinian nonviolent resistance. Something that could be similar to what happened in the first intifada. Second, and that is even, should be put as first precondition, is uh, Palestinian internal unity and ending this horrible internal division between Hamas and Fatah that is used uh, by Netanyahu and all the enemies of the Palestinian people against us. But third, uh, the world community and uh, especially those governments who claim that they support uh, international law and that ab abide by international law should stop using uh, double standards when it comes to the Palestinian-Israeli issue and should impose sanctions on Israel if it proceeds with this plan. Uh, sanctions and boycott uh, has been used against other countries uh, who, ad, who, who annexed land by force. The international law is very clear. The UN resolutions are very clear. Uh, what Israel is about to do is a, an extreme violation of international law and uh, a violation of the uh, advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. And it's going to be a war crime. That's why everything justifies an immediate and very clear message to Israel that if you go on and annex occupied Palestinian territories, you will encounter sanctions. These are the three elements, in my opinion, that could provide a possibility of deterring Netanyahu and his government from proceeding with these horrible plans. Say, say more, uh, tell us a little bit more about the role of the International Criminal Court and the, uh, uh, the present investigation of, quote, the situation in Palestine, uh, <clears throat> as it's called. The International Court of Justice is very important, and we've uh, been, uh, I've been on the National Committee that follows the issue, as I was a member of the committee that went to the International Court of Justice and got one of the best uh, opinions from that government ever, from that uh, court ever. Uh, ICC is very important. We're proceeding with that. We have provided the uh, International uh, criminal court with all evidence and uh, documents that prove that Israel has committed war crimes, whether in the attack in Gaza or in relationship to settlement activities, or in the way it is dealing with Palestinian prisoners. Uh, now the annexation would represent the mother of all crimes. And uh, ICC, as you know, is subjected to uh, pressures from United, the United States, from other countries, who tried to prohibit its uh, proceeding with the investigation of Israeli war crimes. Uh, we hope that the court will proceed and will not, uh, will not uh, 
accept the pressures or bend to them. And, uh, but that is a long process. Uh, the ICC is important, but it's not an alternative or a substitute to the necessity of having political brave measures against the Israeli annexation plans, especially by the European countries, who have refrained so far from, from at least recognizing the state of Palestine, although they speak all the time about two-state solution. And uh, they have refrained so far from even waiving the possibility of, any, of, 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 uh, of uh, sanctions Although they have the upper tool, I mean, uh, the biggest trade in the, with the world is between Israel, the biggest Israeli trade is with the European Union. The biggest scientific agreements are with the European Union and the European countries. And there is a huge military trade with the European countries. Yeah. So in my opinion, they do have the instruments, they have the tools. The question is whether they will have the courage to use them or not. And by the way, let me, I mean, I, I don't want to jump into your next question, but, <laughs> but uh, let me tell you, I am, as a Palestinian, I'm not worried. I am not pessimistic. Uh, I believe uh, things we should do, we should do as Palestinians, but there are things that the world should do. Uh, and, and the option here is one of two. Either they will stop Netanyahu and uh, save the ability of the Palestinians to have an independent state and save what they call the two-state solution. Or, and that is most probably what's going to happen, they will fail to do that. And uh, I don't see a problem with us fighting and struggling for one state solution, one democratic state. Uh, we will never ever accept to be slaves of a system of apartheid. We will, I know the struggle will be longer and harder, but I believe it has only one end, which is uh, victory and success, uh, and bringing down the system of apartheid uh, in the whole of the area, I mean completely. And uh, having a one-state solution with full democratic rights for everybody and the equal rights and equal, uh, equal duties. But that state will not be Jewish only. That state will uh, could have a Palestinian as its president. Uh, our numbers here, I mean, the biggest uh, flaw of uh, Mr. Netanyahu's plan is the fact that uh, to, today the number of Palestinians living on the land of historic Palestine is equal to the number of Israeli Jewish people. Uh, originally, our uh, goal was one democratic state. And it was the world community that pressured us so much uh, including some of the leaders of Jewish community in the United States, like Rita Hauser and, and uh, Stanley Scheinbaum and others, and the socialist leaders of Europe, that tried to convince Palestinians to accept two-state solution, and we did. The PLO accepted a little tiny state in 22% of the land of historic Palestine, while the UN resolution gave us 44%. We accepted a very difficult compromise. But to see now Israel compromising the compromise and, and trying to substitute a, a real Palestinian state with sovereignty, with clusters of ghettos and pantostans, I call them ghetto stands, 224 small islands separated by settlements and, uh, and bypass roads and, uh, and, and uh, checkpoints. This is not uh, going to be acceptable to us. We will struggle. And, uh, and by the way, the intention of Netanyahu to start a system of apartheid is very clear. Today he declared that he will annex the land, but not the people. Uh, which means what? Two systems of laws for two people living in the same place. That is what, is, what apartheid is. I mean, that is, that is the description of apartheid. We interviewed uh, a couple of weeks ago, Jeff Halper and Awad Abdel Fattah. Uh, who uh, are part of the One Democratic leaders of the One Democratic State campaign. But there are other One Democratic State um, plans and strategies. Does the PNI subscribe to a particular one, or is that too far down the road right now? There are other, there are other uh, 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 strategies that you have to follow in order to get there first. No, we as PNI did not refuse uh, the idea of Palestinian state and uh, uh, in the land occupied in 1967, uh, given that this will also include the right of refugees, uh, the right of return for refugees. 
and uh, Jerusalem as the capital of the Palestinian state. But we also wrote as early as, uh, I wrote as early as 1999, which is like 21 years ago, exactly six years after the Oslo Agreement was signed and when it became clear that Netanyahu was killing it. Uh, I wrote that if they kill this option, we, we have to ask for one democratic state. And that's what we are advocating now. And, uh, but I have to clarify two points here. One point that it should be clear that the one, the side that killed the two states option is not the Palestinian side, it's the Israeli yeah. side. The second point is that uh, we're not talking here about only equal civil rights, because some people present it as one democratic state with equal civil rights. No, it's more than that. We're speaking about one democratic state with equal civil and national rights. It means abandoning and abolishing the nation state law that was passed by the Knesset, which says that self-determination on the land, they call it Eretz Israel, which means historic Palestine, that the self-determination right is exclusive for Jewish people. That is not acceptable to us. Uh, we have to have self-determination rights as well. So that's what, why we are more specific. We say one democratic state with equal civil and national rights. Huh. One more thing, you have to be careful about some people who say, yeah, let it be one, demo one state, but they mean one state with a system of apartheid. Yeah. And that, that has to be clear. I wanted to ask you about this, and we've got a couple people who uh, uh, asked this too in the, in the chat room. Uh, even for friends uh, and advocates for Palestinian justice, the internal dynamics of Palestinian leadership is at best disarray and at worst even in conflict. You mentioned Fatah and Hamas, uh, how uh, uh, that relationship needs to be uh, um, to be healed. Uh, and the question that has come up in, in the chat room is, what, what's the likelihood that um, the various parties and the various factions within the Palestinian leadership can unite around one democratic state as you described it? Or is there a real distrust? Is there a real distrust that Israel say, will say one thing and mean something else? That's what I keep hearing from folks who are who are, who are my colleagues in Palestinian advocacy here in this country? Well, uh, first of all, the, the only alternative to two-state solution, if Israel kills that and it is killing it, is one democratic state. Uh, I do think that uh, eventually all Palestinian groups will, uh, will stand behind this approach. Uh, but at the same time, we have to admit that uh, uh, we are in very urgent need to have one unified strategy and one unified leadership. And uh, let me explain here that uh, while the struggle for our rights should unify us, and usually it does, the establishment of a Palestinian authority through Oslo Agreement has created a very unhealthy dispute between Fatah and Hamas about the authority itself. While the authority itself is under occupation, whether you talk about West Bank or Gaza Strip, different forms of occupation for sure. In Gaza, the army is not inside Gaza, but it is surrounding Gaza, besieging it from every direction. It is controlling the airspace, it's controlling the sea. In the West Bank, it is cutting the country into pieces. So in reality, both authorities are under occupation. And today it is becoming more and more clear that the authority is totally limited. And it's an authority without authority while they are fighting over the authority. If they all reject the Trump's plan, the, and if they all reject the annexation, why shouldn't, be, shouldn't we be unified immediately? Uh, I think there is another element which has to be taken into consideration, and I am very frank about that. And I don't see any problem having self-criticism when it, when it is needed. I think one of our, our big weaknesses is the lack of internal democracy. And had we all accepted democratic approach, had we all accepted pluralism within the Palestinian movement, we would not have been in this difficult situation. 
And that's why I speak about unified leadership that is based on democratic participation and on power sharing when it comes to decision making. The, no party in Palestine uh, has been so active and so, in, so insistent in trying to get Palestinian internal unity like Palestinian National Initiative, which I, um, which I belong to. We were the mediators between Fatah and Hamas in 2006. We managed to push them both in the direction of having uh, the first and the only national unity government which was fought against, uh, unfortunately, by Israelis and many others, and fell down after three months. We were the ones who initiated the 2014 agreement. We were the ones who initiated and tried to push for uh, the meetings that took place recently in Moscow between different uh, Palestinian groups. And we are still pushing for that. And uh, why? Because we believe in unity and we believe that the future of Palestinians depends on having a unified leadership. This is something that uh, Haider Abd al-Shafi, one of the, founder of the founders of the Palestinian National Initiative, called for very early in the 90s. And uh, we thought that through democratic elections that we had in 2005 and 2006, we could end up with having that unified democratic leadership. Unfortunately, so many people played the uh, games inside the Palestinian scene. And we have now this horrible internal uh, division that we have to overcome. So I believe democracy, unified leadership is the key to our successful struggle for our rights. I want to ask one more question about the politics. Uh, um, last week, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas declared all security uh, agreements with Israel and the U.S. void in response to the planned Israeli annexation uh, of parts of the West Bank. Um, were you uh, a part of that, his, his advisory committee? Were you uh, a part of the, the plans uh, for him to uh, declare uh, those agreements void? Uh, say a little bit more about uh, his decision to, uh, to declare void his agreements with uh, security agreements with Israel and the U.S.? Uh, we are not in the executive committee of the PLO. In a way, we represent the democratic opposition within the PLO. But we were invited to that meeting of leadership, and we participated in it, and we participated in that decision. That's for sure. We were not in the commission or the committee that uh, prepared it, but we were in the meeting that declared it. Uh, that, for me, that decision means three things. First of all, immediate and full cessation of all kinds of security coordination uh, with the Israeli side and with the American intelligence services. That means uh, nullifying Oslo agreement, which Israel has killed. It's basically liberating Palestinians from, uh, from uh, commitments that Israel has already violated long time ago. And uh, it should also mean uh, that uh, the, the, there is uh, uh, revisiting all of all existing agreements. Of course, the situation is very difficult and complicated. And Netanyahu is now trying to respond by saying, if you cut security coordination, I will stop civil coordination, which means the end of the Palestinian Authority, by the way, to, to be clear. And uh, I say if the cost of uh, keeping our uh, struggle alive and refusing to be slaves of occupation is to sacrifice the authorities, so let it be. But uh, we will not be the ones who abandon the structures we have built uh, with our struggle all these years. And uh, that does not mean we should give up the, our health system or educational system or other systems that we are running ourselves. Uh, it means that the world will go back to seeing the situation of an occupying power and occupied people. Uh, so uh, it's not clear what's going to happen. Netanyahu is having hopes that the uh, block of, of uh, the, 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 the suspension of security coordination will not last. That's his, these are his hopes. I actually just finished the writing an article which will be published on Sunday about that. Why Netanyahu, what does Netanyahu hope for? 
He's hoping for uh, no, lack of seriousness on the Palestinian side. He's hoping definitely that the Palestinian internal division will continue. He's hoping that the American side will support him fully and completely. He's hoping that Europe will only uh, restrict itself to just declarations that mean nothing to him. He is hoping that the Arab reaction will be weak. And uh, that these are his hopes. And uh, we have to make them false. I mean, we have to, we, uh, the, the most important thing that is in our hand now as Palestinians, and nobody can take it away from us, is three things. Ending division and declaring unified leadership. Adopting a strategy of resistance to, to, to the Israeli plans and demanding sanctions on Israel. And these are, in my opinion, the three key components of our future strategy. I want to return to the politics in a minute, but I don't want to get any further in, the, uh, in our time together without you uh, uh, saying, we talked about this before uh, we came on the air, but say a word about how busy you've been uh, in the Palestinian Medical Relief Society during the pandemic. Uh, you, you alluded to the success of Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian civil society keeping the pandemic at, at a minimum in Palestine. But say a word about uh, the history uh, and, and the work of the Palestinian Medical Relief Society, especially during this particular uh, period of time in COVID-19. Palestinian Medical Relief Society is a voluntary health movement, uh, which was initiated uh, more than 40 years ago by us when we were very young professionals and uh, doctors and nurses and so on. Uh, and uh, it was an initiative to deal with the uh, declined uh, horrible health situation because of uh, total negligence from the Israeli side, which was controlling the occupied territories. At that time, the infant mortality rate was about 150 per thousand, which means 15% of all born children in Palestine would die before reaching the age of one year. We had epidemics everywhere. We had uh, all kinds of infectious diseases and a rising rate of non-communicable diseases like heart disease and diabetes and so on. So we took the initiative of creating an independent health movement, which was grassroots and based mainly on voluntary contribution. And we did manage to build an organization which grew fast and uh, quickly because there was huge need and huge spirit of volunteerism. So while in 1982 we treated and helped 2,000 Palestinians, in 2019 we helped one and a half million Palestinians. The beauty about medical relief is that it is a national health organization that is unified, which means it works in West Bank, in Gaza, and in East Jerusalem equally. And uh, it is one of the very few remaining unified organizations in the country. It is a, also a leader in building civil society, and uh, it has played a very important role in promoting democracy and uh, civil society participation. During COVID-19 cam uh, campaign, we worked uh, in parallel on two lines. First, good coordination with the Palestinian Ministry of Health and the government. Uh, participating in the national committee which was created, giving the right advice about how to encounter the COVID-19. But also we took on ourselves the responsibility of prevention and uh, massive public health education about what should be done to fight the COVID-19. And since the strategy we were proposing and that was agreed about by the government itself was prevention, 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 we managed really to have uh, excellent contribution. We distributed hundreds of thousands of leaflets and posters. We used social media intensively. We reached out to people. Our volunteers in thousands participated in uh, disinfecting places and in giving advice to people how to manage uh, crowds. Uh, in uh, also reaching out and uh, while many, many, most of the clinics in the country closed down because of the, of the COVID-19, we, we were the only organization that continued to work with fantastic uh, 
people who ran 50 projects and clinics, permanent clinics in the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and Jerusalem, as well as uh, 10 mobile clinics that reach out to 110 communities that are totally dependent on our services. There is no other alternative services, especially in Area C, the so-called Area C and in Bedouin communities. These are the same communities that are targeted now by the process of annexation. So uh, all in all, uh, we also played a very important role in helping people with disability and reaching out to them and continuing the program for them, as well as uh, continuing the work for, with pregnant women and also fighting sexual uh, harassment and gender-based violence. So it, it's, uh, I'm so proud of this organization where not a single volunteer or worker said, I will stay home and will not come to work. And uh, uh, that gives me great spirit and great belief in this uh, wonderful organization that will last for long after we go and uh, will become and has become, in my opinion, a cornerstone in the Palestinian health system. You know, uh, um, and yet, what we hear in the, uh, in the West is, that, is how successful Israel has been in uh, fighting back against, you know, uh, one of the success stories, fighting against the COVID-19 virus. Not much is said at all, not much is said at all uh, about the success of the Palestinian society and the healthcare system. And again, uh, in our conversation before we came on the air here, you mentioned something about the, uh, um, about how more than 70% of the cases in Palestine uh, were con contracted uh, because of the, uh, the Palestinians were, were workers within Israel that brought it back uh, into Palestine itself from Israel. Uh, and some of the stories that we've heard has been that as soon as a Palestinian worker within Israel gets sick, they're immediately taken to one of the checkpoints and left uh, right on the other side, left to fend for themselves within Palestinian society. Say a little bit more about that, would you please? Sure. First of all, uh, yes, Israel was relatively successful in comparison to some other countries like Italy and Spain. But the shocking thing for some people is that we were, we were even more successful than Israel. I'll give you one figure which tells you a lot. The uh, death per million people worldwide is around 41. 41 people death uh, versus every million people of population, 41. In Israel, it was 31. In Palestine, it was less than one, 0.8 per million. So exactly that means that Israel had 30, more, 30 times more deaths than Palestinians had. And the world had 40 times more deaths than Palestinians had. Although we have no comparison in terms of equipment. Uh, as I said, Israel has had 4,000 uh, pieces of ventilators and we had only together between Gaza and West Bank, uh, no more than 360. So that means, in my opinion, there was great success. But one has to mention the fact that Israel discriminated against the Palestinian population, yeah. not only in terms of equipment, but in terms of tests. There was the number of tests performed for Israeli Jewish people versus Palestinians in East Jerusalem, which is controlled totally by Israel, or in Israel itself, where the ratio was 10 to 1. That tells you a lot. There was total lack of attention to preventive acts in East Jerusalem, and that's why we had to take the responsibility on ourselves. But the greatest mistake, in my opinion, and the greatest uh, sin here was that Israel refused to provide the workers working in Israel with the necessary equipment or the necessary conditions or means of prevention. And when they came back to the West Bank, they did not perform tests for them. And uh, that's why, as you said, about now at this time, uh, it stands at 78%. 78% of all people infected in Palestinian territories uh, got it from the Israeli side through workers working in Israel. And of course, you are right, there were five cases of workers who were thrown on the street with fever, 
when the Israelis suspected they were having coronavirus, instead of taking them to hospitals or providing them with the necessary treatment. How are you doing with the testing supplies, with contact tracing, with uh, personal protective equipment? Uh, uh, you, you, we, you talked about the, the lack of uh, number of incubators. What about, what about the rest of the PPEs? We had very difficult time the first month. There was very, very serious shortage. Uh, we had to find, uh, to use every possible way to get uh, protective equipment, especially for our medical teams. But luckily, uh, some Palestinian factories started developing them and, fabric uh, and uh, producing them, uh, which was excellent and helped a lot. And uh, eventually, we managed to start having uh, enough uh, or, or sufficient, relatively sufficient amount of uh, other personal equipment. We still lack uh, seriously uh, a number of ventilators or respirators. And uh, we still have a very low number of tests in comparison to Israel or the other parts of the world. So especially in Gaza. Uh, so the, the ratio of tests, let me check for you. I think uh, what we have here is, uh, if we look at the ratio of tests, it's uh, uh, 10 times more in Israel than what we had in the West Bank, and maybe 20 times more than what we had in uh, Gaza Strip. Mm. But we are trying to, to continue the work, and uh, we feel better now in terms of protecting our medical staff. There's a question here about uh, generational differences. So let me just read it for you. Please. Do you see generational differences in political attitudes and engagement, civil society, activism, party support? That is, what do you make of the politics among youth and whether or how they might differ from the old guard of Palestinian civil society and politics? The younger generation, in my, in my opinion, is, uh, first of all, you have to understand that 80% of the Palestinian population are below the age of 33. And uh, that, by well, the way, is another... Below the age of 33, 80% below the age of 33. Exactly. Okay. And this, this was also a factor, to be fair, in, uh, in us having... Uh, better uh, results in fighting uh, COVID-19. It's a factor that one has to take into consideration. But uh, the younger generation, uh, we feel, uh, is deprived from the chances and potential of uh, taking leadership positions. In most parties, most movements, in the official leadership and the authority, and the main reason why there is no advancement of uh, participation of young people in leadership positions is the absence of elections since 2006. We had no elections so far since 14 years. I mean parliamentary elections or presidential elections. We had uh, partial uh, municipality elections and each time this was a good opportunity to advance young people to take leadership positions as well as women. And, uh, uh, but I think uh, in general, there is a certain amount of uh, disappointment and dismay on the, younger, on the side of younger people because of lack of opportunity to participate in leadership positions. Uh, I think uh, the younger generation has different uh, way of dealing with politics than the older generation. As you know, they are much better users of uh, social media. But at the same time, uh, uh, it makes them also susceptible to short uh, populist messages, if I may so, so say so. That's why, uh, in my opinion, uh, the future of politics in Palestine depends on how much we can get and engage the younger generation how much, and, and they will not get engaged unless they participate in everything from, uh, from grassroots work to leadership positions. Uh, I think the majority of the younger generation does not believe in Oslo agreement. 
and does not believe in, uh, the pot in any possibility now for a compromise because of what they see on the ground. So in a way, I would say they are more radicalized. And, uh, but this radicalization uh, requires more attention to convincing them or them getting convinced on their own with the need for political organization. I think worldwide we see this phenomena of individualism and abstention from political organization and maybe even social organization. That's why maybe COVID-19, maybe the huge challenges we are facing now with the Israeli side will be uh, contributing factors to convincing more young people uh, of the value and necessity of political organization. I want to, uh, um, there's another question here about that. We had heard that um, viewers who have received some personal protective equipment from the UAE through Israel. And uh, the question is, did you receive that? No. Uh, Palestine received the uh, personal protective equipment as donations from China. Uh, from the government of China, and then uh, there was uh, another plane that came through uh, from the business community, uh, Alibaba, I think, uh, mainly company. And uh, we also received support from uh, uh, financial support from Qatar, from uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, I think, small amounts, but uh, that was received. Uh, there was also uh, some support that came from Turkey. Uh, regarding the Emirates, uh, uh, we were all surprised, and uh, the, the government, the Palestinian Authority, was surprised that the uh, plane landed in uh, Ben Gurion Airport without any coordination of the Palestinian side. And they said that they brought. Uh, personal protective equipment. The Palestinian Authority refused to receive this uh, destination, uh, uh, mainly because uh, it was the first time that a plane from the United Arab Emirates lands in Israel, while Israel is planning to annex the occupied territories. And uh, that's why it was perceived as an act of normalization with the Israeli government using humanitarian Palestinian needs. It was rejected. I was interviewed on Al Jazeera about this issue. And I said, if the Emirates really means well, they should take back their plane to Jordan and then coordinate with the Palestinians. And then their support can be transported through Jordan to the Palestinian side. That was the end of the story. Here's another question from uh, um, uh, uh, on the chat room. Are you worried that due to economic and political desperation, there will be violence instead of nonviolent protests? I am a believer in nonviolence, uh, not because I don't, uh, I don't think that people, people who are occupied or oppressed do not have the right to use all means of struggle uh, that are legitimate by international law, including, uh, including using uh, military struggle. Uh, as long as the people respect international law and do not attack civilians, etc. But I don't believe that in the case of Palestine today, the right strategy is that strategy. I think the right strategy is a strategy of nonviolence. I think it's more effective. Uh, it uh, deprives uh, the Israeli government from the claim, the continuous claim that they are the victims in this uh, situation. And uh, it is more effective because it means uh, the participation of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people in the struggle, rather than limiting the struggle to a small number of people. Our history is full of uh, examples uh, of uh, different methods that were used. In my opinion, the most successful experience we had was the first Intifada. I am an advocate and a believer in nonviolent resistance. And uh, nonviolence does not mean passivity. Uh, the examples of Martin Luther King and Gandhi and uh, Nelson Mandela are wonderful. And we, have, we, 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 we learned a lot from them. 
And uh, I think we have exercised this form of uh, popular resistance in a very successful way. One excellent example was 2017 when we managed to break Netanyahu, when he tried to impose restrictions on the entrance to the Ma'aksa Mosque. And uh, the other example was the March of Return. And uh, the other third example is uh, the villages of resistance that we created in uh, many areas threatened by the Israeli annexation. Uh, I believe in that. I believe that uh, nonviolence is much more effective and uh, it gives us the moral superiority in the struggle for our rights. Are you in touch with um, um, partners, political partners or uh, 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 peace and justice advocates within Israel? Uh, who, who, might they, who might they be? And uh, tell us about that relationship and, and those conversations. Of course, we always had good relations and continuous cooperation with the groups in Israel that believe in the rights of the Palestinian people, those who support our right to have a, a state of our own, and uh, those who support the end of occupation and uh, who are against the system of racial discrimination and apartheid. We had always very good contacts with people like uh, women in black, uh, uh, physicians for human rights, Yesh uh, Givul, uh, Salem, Gosh Shalom, etc. But let me tell you something. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we have seen that many parties that claim to be on the left in Israel and that are Zionist parties claiming that they want peace and they end up really in the opposite direction. The very good example of that is the Labour Party in Israel, and uh, which was responsible historically for building uh, so many settlements in the occupied territories, and uh, which now is joining Netanyahu's annexation government. Uh, I don't, I never believe that Gantz and his new party is different from Netanyahu, and I think uh, life has proven that. Uh, they are all in the same system, Gantz, Netanyahu, Labour Party. And let me tell you that merits, which stands maybe a little bit different from the others, is also disappointing. I'm sorry to say that, but uh, that's the truth because they also joined forces with the Labour Party before the Labour Party left them to join Netanyahu. Uh, I think that party, unfortunately, has also moved in the wrong direction. I will never forget the fact that uh, uh, at one point, uh, f three years ago maybe, we were invited to uh, a, an, uh, a meeting in, Bro in, Bro in Brussels, and we were supposed to speak there, me and Nabil Shaaz from Fatah, and uh, the head of Merit's party at the time, and a few other Arab speakers. And then uh, the, the leader of that party refused to sit on the same panel with me. And she said that sitting with me on the same panel would cost her voters or votes in the elections. That, in my opinion, is very strange. Uh, if she cannot sit with me, then how she can sit with the rest of the other Palestinians? I mean, so in my opinion, there are many disappointing things in Merit's party, unfortunately, although it stands as much better than all the other parties. Unfortunately, today, the real opposition in Israel, the only real opposition in Israel is the Arab uh, Palestinian, the Arab uh, uh, block, which includes, by the way, uh, uh, a Jewish member from uh, the Israeli Communist Party. Let me, uh, um, I, wanna, I wanna talk about BDS with you and have you, give you a chance to talk more about BDS. You know, increasingly in this country, of course, in Germany and other, uh, other countries, uh, there's a drive to, at the least, uh, um, equate uh, BDS with anti-Semitism, and at worst, as in this country, you know, to criminalize it. Um, 
tell us who are your friends here, why it's continually uh, important to support BDS and share a couple of uh, uh, success stories that have meant the most to you all uh, in Palestine that have really impacted your life on the ground, uh, the BDS victories. Well, uh, <clears throat> first of all, let me explain. I mean, I mean uh, BDS is not anti-Semitic. BDS is non-violent movement. It believes in non-violence. It is not anti-Jewish. It's not against Jewish people in any way. It's not against Israelis as people. It's against the policies of the Israeli government. And it's against annexation and against occupation and against the system of apartheid. So claiming that it is anti-Semitic is not true. And it's a dirty tactic to undermine it. Uh, ironically, I don't know how they can explain and say that we are anti-Semitic as Palestinians when we are Semites ourselves, but that's a side issue. Uh, in my opinion, the Zionist movement in Israel has used this argument uh, of being too aggressive against anybody who is in solidarity with the Palestinian rights. So they put people in four categories worldwide. The first category is uh, you have to, is, is to be absolutely supportive of Israel and unconditional, even when it is violating international law and so on. These are the good people for them. Then if you are a Palestinian struggling for your rights, they describe you as terrorists. If you are an international who is supporting Palestinian rights and international law, you are described as anti-Semite. And if you are a Jewish person that is supporting Palestinian rights, they call you a self-hating Jew. I mean, these are the four categories that Netanyahu and people like him have been trying to impose on the world community. And BDS is attacked viciously because it is effective. Why? BDS is a great invention that allowed people in solidarity with Palestine to make their solidarity material. Because by using BDS, they cost occupation. They make the occupation costly, economically and morally. Second, it provides Palestinians in the diaspora with a powerful instrument to participate in the Palestinian struggle. Uh, it's not just having demonstrations and so on. It's being engaged with a co-joint struggle with their other people in, the, in, in Palestine itself. And uh, it's a way of making them effective in this struggle. That's why Israel is so much against this movement. And that's why they are allocating millions of dollars to badmouth it or by, to undermine it or to misrepresent it or to criminalize it, as you say. Uh, uh, but I, I, I think uh, it, it will not succeed. I think eventually BDS will grow more and more. Now, uh, what are the success stories? Many. But uh, maybe the two most important success stories is uh, when uh, companies like SodaStream had to leave the close down their factories inside Israeli settlements and move out because they were losing money because of the boycott campaign. Uh, the closure of uh, the, the fact that certain uh, big investment institutions like uh, a Norwegian investment uh, fund uh, decided to divest from uh, major Israeli banks because of their uh, branches in settlements. Uh, the fact that some, some shops had to close down like Ahava in, uh, in London. Uh, but uh, the greatest recent success was the publication after long struggle of the lists or list of the names of all uh, companies working inside Israeli settlements, which provides a very good tool to uh, encourage people to boycott these companies who are violating the international. I've got a couple more questions. I'm aware of the time, uh, but I have a couple more that uh, have been asked on chat and that I have. One of, the, one of the questions in the chat room is, how strongly should Palestinian leadership in historic Palestine support the Palestinian right of return? Totally, of course, it's a right. 
It's a right that is, uh, that is uh, confirmed by international law. And it is a right that is uh, legitimized also by a special uh, resolution uh, which was issued by United Nations General Assembly. And it was one condition of recognition of Israel uh, by United Nations. Uh, and uh, it's a right. The people have the right to return to the places they were displaced from. And uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, that is a sign of equality as well. Uh, if you are allowing Jewish people to come to Israel, why you don't allow Palestinian original people to come back to the place they were born in or their fathers were born in? So uh, I, I, Israel is trying to, in the, if you look at the so-called deal of the century, which is nothing but uh, Netanyahu's ideas written by an American pen. Uh, if you look at that uh, plan, you will notice that Israel is trying to equate uh, Palestinian refugees with uh, Jewish people who immigrated to Israel from Arab countries. I have no problem by, of, of giving the right of return to both sides, if that's what they want. Uh, but uh, I believe that uh, you cannot expect us to deny Palestinian refugees their right of return, while Israel is giving that right to any person who is born in Siberia or New York and whose family has never lived in Palestine for centuries. What's the likelihood of Palestinian elections uh, and uh, what role would uh, PNI play in that? And um, what, what would be your personal participation? You interested in political office, Mustafa? You, or, or, or have you been there, done that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the unfortunate thing is that we did not have the normal elections which should have happened every four years. Uh, I don't know if your uh, audience knows, but uh, uh, I love elections uh, and uh, I am an advocate of elections and the right of people to participate. And I'm a big fighter against fraud in elections. Uh, I don't know if the people know that I actually participated three times already. Uh, and uh, in 19 2005, I was the one who competed with Mr. Abbas for presidency. Right. And I was the runner up, as they call it. And uh, I think it was a very good move. It provided a fantastic opportunity for people in opposition to show their opinions. Uh, and I still believe that uh, people made a mistake in 2005. Maybe if the results were different, we would have been in a different situation today. But that is something of the past. Uh, 2006, I participated. I headed the list of Palestinian National Initiative for Legislative Council elections, and we succeeded. Uh, and we would participate in any future elections, but these elections have to be free and fair, and they should, uh, we should never accept any exclusion of any parts of the occupied territories. Uh, there were people who were calling for elections in, without Gaza, we don't accept that, or without Jerusalem, and we definitely refuse that. So elections have to take place everywhere. And, uh, but what kind of elections we will have now if annexation process continues, that's a different story. We'll see. Maybe we will have elections for one democratic state one day. Ah. And we'll see what happens. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> As you know, we're in an election here uh, in the US. Uh, Donald Trump, of course, has been a disaster for the Palestinian cause, but, but Joe Biden's political history is one of unconditional support for the state of Israel. Do you see any hope uh, for help for Palestinians from the U.S.? And uh, where, do you, where do you look for hope and help in the international community? I believe in building uh, grassroots support to Palestinians in the United States. I believe we should have uh, dialogue with uh, Congress people, with senators, with influential people. But I believe the main goal of the Palestinian movement should be to link itself with the progressive forces in the United States. 
we are we have not done proper work to link with the African American community, with the uh, uh, women movements in the United States, with the youth movements, with the different progressive forces in the United States. The Palestinian Authority made a big mistake by, by relying and hoping for the administration to solve its problems. And uh, the reality is that uh, there was a big failure. And the biggest failure of all was the Obama's failure, actually, because we had so many hopes in him. We were so encouraged by his speech in Cairo when he, in his first year of the, uh, in his term, when he spoke about uh, against settlement activities. But unfortunately, he, he was eventually disappointed because he did not proceed with his approach. And uh, uh, I, I, I do believe that uh, there are so many good Americans who believe in human rights, who believe in the rights of people, who believe in freedom. And we should link to all these people. I don't have, uh, I, I, am, I, I, I think when you speak about the administration, I think the biggest challenge now is for the American people to have an administration that fulfills their own interests. Uh, you have suffered as Americans from Trump. You have suffered as Americans from Trump's administration. Uh, look at the health situation in the United States. Look at the lack of investment in healthcare. Look at the fact that 30% of the American people do not have uh, public health insurance. Look at the fact that uh, so many Americans are dying today because of uh, improper policies. So as much as we need a government in the United States that cares for Palestinian rights, it has to be a government that cares for American rights before even our rights. We, uh, um, uh, and by the way, I think uh, uh, the only American candidate that we were hoping would win was Bobby Sanders, but, un but, but, but unfortunately he lost the race yeah. for the second time. Recently, uh, um, uh, uh, the PA began to ease uh, the COVID-19 restrictions in uh, uh, occupied Palestine. You uh, are in Ramallah. Um, Eid uh, at the end of Ramadan has come. Uh, and, uh, businesses and restaurants are allowed to open now. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, as we wrap up the interview today, tell us a little bit about where things stand in the reopening of the West Bank and in Gaza. Well, uh, the lockdown is over completely. In Gaza, they are maintaining a very good regimen of, uh, of putting anybody that enters Gaza from, up, from outside in quarantine for 28 days. Uh, it was our advice to them, we consult with them also, uh, that they should extend the period because we know that there are cases who can have the the signs of infection after 21 days or 22 days. So they are restricting themselves to very strict quarantine and anybody who comes from outside Gaza is subjected to that, which is very good. And uh, unfortunately, they don't have enough number of tests, but so far they managed to control the situation. The number of cases is only 60 in Gaza. If there's a spread, like if there is community infection in Gaza, it will be a disaster, believe me. So, so far the restrictions have been good, but, they, but, the, but, but there is no lockdown. Uh, in the case of West Bank, it's more complicated because we have open borders uh, in terms of contact with Israel and Israel allows it to be loose. So, uh, uh, in my opinion, the uh, bringing down the lockdown was too rapid and uh, they should have gone a bit slower and uh, more gradually. But what was done was done. We'll see now what happens. Uh, so far, it's not that bad. Uh, the main thing that concerns me is the continuous flow of workers. Now Israel has opened the, completely the access yeah. to workers. So that will represent a big challenge that we have to face. What's happening is that whenever they discover a place with cases, they lock it down again. 
Uh, and then the big challenge for us is how to strategize and plan for what will happen in next October. We have a question from one of the leaders of the Jewish Voice for Peace here in this country. Uh, let me just read the question. Probably the greatest achievement of BDS in this country has been that it has deeply changed the perception of right and wrong in Israel-Palestine on American campuses, even within mainstream Jewish youth. Do you have some thoughts on how best to harness this potential political powerhouse? I think flexibility is the answer and uh, uh, avoiding dogmatism and uh, spreading the word about Palestinian rights and accepting what people can do. If somebody wants to boycott settlements, she's welcome. If somebody wants to, uh, to boycott Israel in general, that's uh, just fine. Uh, there has to be flexibility in that regard, but also it's very important to present uh, side by side while you advocate for BDS. It is so important to present the Palestinian narrative to the people. And uh, there is uh, nobody I'm, I'm, I'm proud of more than the Jewish American people or Jewish people in general who are standing up against Netanyahu's policies and who are standing in support of the Palestinian people. These are noble people. They are to be admired. We know that uh, sometimes they are described as traitors, but they are the real, uh, the people who have the real values. Uh, I will never forget the case of a lady who was 84 years old at the time, a survival of the Holocaust. And she joined us uh, in one of the ships that were supposed to uh, break the siege on Gaza. Uh, that woman, who is a survival of the Holocaust, understood very well uh, the noble idea of uh, the Jewish values, uh, understood that the suffering of those Jewish people in the Holocaust or in the pogroms of Russia or in the anti-Semitic time in Europe is not justify, does not justify the oppression of Israeli government of the Palestinian people. And I think those who, who, who are supporting us are the best uh, people who honor uh, the, the memory of those Jewish people, who, Jewish people who suffered in the Holocaust. And I hope that we will have more and more of these people. Because at the end of the day, and I would repeat something that I believed in for so many years, at the end of the day, what we are doing here in Palestine, we are struggling not only for the future of Palestinians, but of Israelis as well. And what we do is that uh, to send a very clear message to every Israeli and every Jewish person that you will not be free unless Palestinians are free first. That is, that is the truth. Exactly like the situation was in South Africa. Even the white oppressors were not free from the system of apartheid and they, will, they, would, not, they would not become free un until the African people were freed from the apartheid system. I'm going to let uh, Dr. Borgucci have the last word, uh, but before I do, I want to announce that the next in our ongoing, ongoing uh, series of Indiana Center for Middle East Peace interviews will be in two weeks from today, Thursday, June 11th, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, with uh, Reverend Terry Ballinger, English language pastor at the Lutheran Church of Our Redeemer in the old city of Jerusalem, talking about ministry in a time of pandemic in in Jerusalem. So please share that uh, news with your friends. So Dr. Mustafa Barghouti, uh, thank you for coming today. Hang on after uh, we hang up, but uh, do you have any parting words for us? I just wish you the best in fighting COVID-19. I wish you all to stay healthy and uh, avoid this disease as much as you can. Uh, I wish the world uh, that we will get over this pandemic and but also, I wish that the world would learn the proper lessons from what's happening. I am a dreamer of a social, worldwide social movement that could stand up uh, to the big task of changing the economic and health policies worldwide. 
and uh, I ask you for continuing your solidarity with the Palestinian people and please convey our messages to the people you know. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Dr. Barguchi, thank you. I want to remind all of you that uh, this uh, interview will be posted on the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube page. We'll see you again in two weeks on Thursday, June 11th with Pastor Kerry Ballinger. Thank you all for joining us today.